Good morning, everyone. If you can hear me, honk. Hey, that's great. Uh, I'm gonna. I have a little fantasy about being on the radio. So this is the HPC HPCC Broadcasting Network, and this is interrupting for some late breaking news. Next week will be the first time that we'll have absentee ballots available for our uh, annual meeting. Uh, so I'm going to read the ballot for you today. We will read it again next week and you can pick up an absentee ballot and then uh, June 7th is when we will have our uh, election. So uh, we have uh, two openings for men on the board and we have four choices. We have Tommy Nichols, Eric Paul, Billy Call, and Gary Donovan. We have one woman position open, and we have two choices. We have Kathy Smith and Sally Humphreys. We also have one trustee position open, and we have Terry Ely and Kenny Huff as uh, your choices for that. And uh, Miss Marla Arrowood will be your new Sunday school superintendent, and you will just need to vote yes or no on that. So that is the ballot. You can pick up an absentee ballot next week, and we will have the actual vote on June 7th. Okay, now, if you remember that, I just said June 7th. That is the big news. June 7th is when we were going to be all in our Father's house. We're going to open it up. Yes, yes. Uh, we will be under some social distancing guidelines, so... There will be rows of chairs missing in the, in the sanctuary, and we can only fit so many in. So what we have planned, and plans may be changed, but what we have planned is there will be chairs set up in the gym, and there will also be chairs set up in the fellowship hall in case we have so many that we have overflow. And we will have a TV screen in each one of these rooms here in the fellowship hall so you will be able to see live as as pastor cody does the sermon you'll be able to see it and still be in in the building and that is a tentative plan that we have set up and we also have tentative plans for us still to be broadcasting out here in the parking lot if you still don't feel comfortable about coming in so that's our tentative plan for june 7th we are going to open the doors we are going to have social distancing and we're going to be Inside our father's house. Okay. We're also going to be that morning. There will be the regular two services. The one at 830 and the one at 1030. And there's going. I'm sorry. At this time we can't have Sunday school. Because we can't work out the social distancing. There's too many people in some of these classrooms. So for the month of June Sunday school will not be held. And so there's going to be an hour's difference between the early service and the late service, but that's going to give us time to do our disinfecting and cleaning between the services. So everything is going to be perfectly fine for inside. Everything's going to be scrubbed down, clean, disinfected, so we can have both services safely. And that's all of my announcements. Thank you. Oh, tell if I, help if I turned on the mic. It was brought to my attention this morning that we have a couple of birthdays. Uh, one of them is Haley Lewis, and the other one's Corrine Smart. Is there any others? <laughs> any others? All right. <laughs> Emily. <laughs> All right, let's sing happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right, we're going to start out our service this morning with Shout to the Lord. Savior, Lord, there is none like 
This morning, we are so thankful for all the vet, all the military personnel that gave their lives for our country, so that we can live free. And even more, we thank you for your Son Jesus, who made us free from sin, as a sacrifice on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
Because he lives.
All right, well, this is week three of our drive-in services, and in traditional Missouri fashion, this is the third different type of weather we've had. So uh, praise God that we can come out this morning, and praise God that pretty soon we'll be able to go inside. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, we've already mentioned it, but just to reiterate, June 7th. So next week, we will be out here one last time, and then June 7th is when we will be back in there, as has already been mentioned, 8.30 and 10.30 service with no Sunday school in between. We'd love to have you. Uh, we're, we're very excited to be back in there. I know you guys are excited to visit with each other. So praise God we're going to be able to do it. So uh, let's, let's have a word of prayer as we begin our sermon. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. So much, Lord, for any opportunity to meet. Lord, what a blessing it truly is to be able to be your church and to gather together as your church. Uh, and, and like most other blessings, you don't realize what you're missing until you don't have it for a little while. So, dear God, I thank you so much for this, this reminder of just how much you've blessed us with such a wonderful church. Lord, with such a wonderful building, but Lord, I speak of the community that we have here. Dear God, I ask that you give us understanding this morning through your word and that you grow us all in righteousness and holiness. And I ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so thank you guys. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. And by way of introduction, I just want to remind you of some stuff we've already went over, some stuff we've already talked about. Uh, this is Peter's last bit of writing before he will, you know, he's going to pass along soon after he writes this. So these are sort of Peter's most important reminders to the church. This is very important to keep in mind because you think, you know, with someone who was as close to Jesus, someone who literally walked with Jesus on a daily basis while Jesus was on this earth, you know, if there was going to be some sort of new information, that's what they would have been looking for. Oh, tell us, tell us another little story about Jesus that we haven't heard yet. You know, tell us about how he did this or how he did that. But that's not what Peter chose to write about. That is not what God gave Peter to write about. He didn't write to them about anything brand new. He wrote to them about what had already been just to remind them. As I've mentioned many times throughout this series, Christianity is often not about getting brand new information. It's about being reminded of the things that have been true this whole time. And here is why. Because Christianity does not just occur on Sundays. It happens all, all week around, all day around, all year around. And oftentimes it's not that, you know, we need new information how to deal with things. We just need to remember what the Word of God has already said when those things come up in life. You know, it's really easy to not get angry at your brother or sister when you're sitting in the church house. But when, you know, they might say or do something to offend you, it's a lot easier to get angry at them. And that's when we need to remember the simple, pure words of God. So that's what Peter is seeking to do through this, through this book. He wants to remind them of everything that they are going to need, of what their perspective needs to be, so that they will be ready for what he's about to talk about. So in verse 1 it says this, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Just as I just said, he's not giving them something new, he's stirring them up by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Now, this is interesting. So what does he want them to remember? First of all, he wants them to remember the predictions of the holy prophets. But what he's actually alluding to when he says that is the Old Testament. The Old Testament of our Bible was written by the holy prophets. So that's what Peter is talking about. And not only that, the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. That would be what was later to be called the New Testament. You know, all the New Testament letters weren't combined into one book when Peter was writing this, obviously, but later on they would be. So he's saying, remember what the Holy Prophet said, and remember what the Apostle said about the Lord. So basically, in our modern day, remember the Old Testament and remember the New Testament. Pay attention to those things. As I preached on a lot last week, spend time in the Bible. That's so important to you, that you might remember these things. Verse 3, knowing this first, all, first of all, the scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So let's pause there for a moment. 
So last week, Peter made sure to really warn us and emphasize false teachers and false prophets who would come in claiming to be Christians, but truly be preaching something other than what Christ taught. This week, he is warning us about scoffers and mockers. These would be those outside of the faith who try to doubt and discourage you in practicing in the faith. And what he mentions about them, he says they're going to mock and say, hey, if Jesus is truly going to come back, why hasn't it happened yet? It's been 2,000 years. Where is he at? Do you hear scoffing like that today? Do you hear, not necessarily just in that line, but, you know, they say, well, what's the evidence that this is actually going to happen? Church, you know, it might be tough to see the evidence at times, but now, of all times, it should be relatively easy to see some of the evidence. Do you think the world is getting better? Do you think we're moving towards this, you know, this worldly vision of a utopia where there's world peace and, and happiness and everyone just gets along? Do you think everyone's getting along better now than we were 50 years ago? No, not at all, right? The world, conti- sin, sin has to reach its natural end. Sin, you know, think of your own lives. Does sin ever just give up and say, you know what? No, we've had our fill. Your sinful nature saying, no, I've had my fill of bad things. Does it work like that? No, of course not. Sin always desires more and more and more. So when we mention whether it's the political spectrum, whether it's in our own personal lives, there is no level of sin that the sinful nature is content with. It always has to go further and further and further and further until it takes everything. Sin is a disease, and it's much more contagious than the coronavirus, and it's much more destructive, too. Sin is absolutely destructive, and it's going to do what it is intended to do. But at the same time, our end is not the same as that of the sinner, and that's what we have to keep in mind. They're saying, oh, hey, it hasn't happened. He's delayed in coming back, so he must not be coming back, so we can do whatever we want. We can just eat, drink, and be merry and have a good time because there are no consequences for our actions. But that is not the case. That's what Peter is trying to remind them. So he continues, he says, For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He says, there is faithfulness in that God will judge the world because he has already judged the world once before. He says they had overlooked this fact because, you know, even though there's tons of evidence of a worldwide flood, the scientists, the experts want to try to explain that away. The Grand Canyon does not happen by mistake. Things like that don't happen by mistake. They are evidence of the judgment that God has already poured out upon the world once before. Peter is reminding us of this. His judgment is true because he's already fulfilled his word at least once in that way. But... He mentions water as the agent by which the world was judged before. In the next verse, he says, But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are being stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The symbolism here is interesting. You know, uh, if you remember the creation story in Genesis... You know, before God said, let there be light, it said the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water, so to speak. Okay, and much of creation had to deal with water. There was an expanse between the waters below and the waters above, and it was called sky. You know, there was life in the water. The water had to be moved to make land come up so that there could be land animals. Water was big in the creation of the world. And so by the same thing that he created the world with and through, he judged the world with the flood. But he says now that that fire is being stored up for the day of judgment. But where do we find that in scripture? We find it with the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit first came upon the believers, upon the apostles, it says it came down as in cloven tongues of fire. Okay, so the new creation was made through fire. John the Baptist even preached of this. He said, I baptize you with fire. Water, but one who will come after me, whose sandal I am not fit to uh, untie or to tie. For I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So likewise, what the new creation is being created with, the world will one day be judged with. 
which begs a natural question. Why water and why fire? What's the difference? How do we compare and contrast those? And there's something very simple that we can all see there. Water and fire are both very necessary for our survival here on this earth. You know, water is something that had to be in, or water is something that has been around in nature. Fire had to be intentionally created. Interesting, isn't it? We were all born of water, so to speak, but we have to be born again of fire, of the Holy Ghost. But, but also, fire is more intense than water. A small amount of water is not dangerous. Water is only dangerous in its overabundance and flooding. But even a small amount of fire can burn you. And a large amount of fire, fire can spread very rapidly. So the second judgment is going to be more intense than the judgment even of the flood. These are things Peter's trying to remind them of and to remind us of now as well. Because the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Instead of just saying, hey, I'm getting ready to leave and I love you guys and you're amazing, he says, watch out because there is going to be a day of judgment by fire on this earth. But verse 8, but do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years are as one day. The entirety of our lives, when our lives are mentioned in the Bible, we are compared to a mist and a vapor. You know, something that is just here for a brief moment and then it is gone. In, in God's perspective, as far as the timeline goes, our lives are incredibly short. And so Peter says, don't mistake the waiting that you have to do for some sort of, you know, slowness on God's part. For this past 2,000 years is merely like a couple of days to God. It's a very short time frame to God because he is eternal. So why is he waiting? Why hasn't he come yet? Well, if he had come 100 years ago, would any of us have even been born, much less born again? No, so he waits for salvation, which is what the text is going to talk about here. Verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some of you count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The Lord is patient with this judgment, just as when he called Noah and said, hey, 120 years from now, I'm going to flood the earth. Prepare. He gave Noah time to build the ark. He didn't simply say, hey, I'm about to flood the world best of luck to you, and then flood it the next day. He gave him time to prepare. Likewise, church, he has given us time that we might be ready and that we might not become slack in our faith, that we might not become lazy, but that we can be prepared for his return. For his return is a very two-sided issue. For those who are not on his side, his return is judgment, but for those who are on his side, his return is salvation and complete deliverance and we want to be ready for that church amen the horns are the horns were quiet this morning so i had to i had to ask for it there all right so he's patient for the sake of salvation that is why god has not yet come back to judge the earth you know in ezekiel 33 Ezekiel says this, say to them, this is the word of the Lord, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn back from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? There are a lot of parallels between the end of Israel and the end of earth. So as you're reading, you know, assuming you, you spend some time in the word, if you read through some of the prophets, especially, you know, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, really just about any of the writings of the prophets, you will see warning after warning towards Israel. And what they were warning about is that Israel had started out right. They had started out following God. But over the course of time, they had been so blessed that they started to worship the blessing instead of the blessor. And so they started to turn away from God and turn towards pointless things. And God kept warning them, turn back, turn back. If you don't turn back, judgment is going to come. What has happened in our country? Okay, whether or not you believe our country is a Christian nation, it is un deniable that our country was founded on many Christian principles. 
And so God is patient with us, but the warning continues to go out. Hey, turn back. Turn away from these sinful ways you're following after and turn back to me. Otherwise, judgment will come. And not just on our country, but on the entire earth. The earth is becoming more and more hostile towards God as the days go by. His name is not allowed to be enacted in many government buildings, and that's just craziness. Okay? His name is being, dis is being barred from certain places. And why? Because they don't like God. The world doesn't like God and doesn't want anything to do with him. But instead of, because this is, this is how great God is, God could just say, okay, boom, and smack him down right there. But if God would have done that, he would have done that to me when I was still in sin, and I never would have had a chance for repentance. So God is patient because he does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants everyone to repent. He wants there to be salvation. But God does not simply force people into something that they don't want any part of. Imagine someone who, you know, imagine someone who is completely against God all of a sudden ending up in heaven. They would hate it there. They would hate to be in God's system. They would hate to simply be in his presence under his rule. They wouldn't like that, so why would God force that upon them? There is a real hell. There is a real place of judgment, and that place is all about the absence of God. Now, God is omnipresent. He can be everywhere, but the absence of even the hope of salvation, that's what hell is. I once had a teacher tell me, you don't even need fire in hell. Now, there is, a going to be a, there is going to be a lake of fire, but what he mentioned is the absolute hopelessness that is coming with that. That is the fate of the unbeliever. Because now, while anyone is alive today, there is still hope for them. There is still hope for salvation. And that is why God has not yet judged the earth. Because salvation is still being preached. People are still coming to the Lord, so he will continue to wait and be patient. But he won't wait forever. He is going to come back. And that's what Peter is reminding us. Let's continue back on verse 10. We get a very important term here. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. You'll find this phrase a lot more in the Old Testament than in the New Testament, but the phrase, the day of the Lord. In our Wednesday night Bible study, we've covered this fairly recently. But the day of the Lord is the day of judgment that is awaiting the earth. Because guys, as much as people might act like it, Sin is not a good thing. Sin is absolutely destructive. And so God, because he is righteous and he is good, is going to have to stamp sin out. He's going to have to destroy sin. But basically, the terminology between water and fire, a bath of water was not enough to wash away sin. Water, you know, from a cleansing standpoint, cleanses our skin. But he says, sin is so, it so permeates the inner being that it takes fire to clean it out. Because fire is very powerful and very intense, but what you find is that fire purifies precious metals. Fire removes the impurities from even some of the most valuable things, and we are that valuable to God, so those who are in him, that fire will refine us. It says it will, the works that are done on the earth will be exposed, you know, it'll lay everything bare. It'll melt away all the chaff, all the bad for us, but for the world, if that is all they have, if they don't have the Holy Spirit within them, they will be burned away with it, because God has to destroy sin. That is his mission. But thanks be to God, he sent Jesus to die for sin that we do not have to, have to all die with sin. That's the thing. God is righteous and he is just, but he must destroy sin for there to be a creation that was as perfect as he originally intended it to be. And let me tell you something, guys, because here's the thing. I wish it were, I wish Sometimes I wish that sin were as simple as it was when I was a kid, where I thought that sin was just a, a series of actions. You know, if I did something wrong, that was a sin. But sin goes deeper than that, because sin is the only reason you are even tempted to do wrong. That's where he's saying sin does not simply reside in the actions. Jesus said, you have heard it say, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you even look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. You know, you have heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, if you're even angry with your brother, because he's saying sin is not just the acts that happen out here. It's something that's going on in your very being. But God can free you. God can free you even from that. 
God does not just correct your actions. He can change your very heart and your very mind so that you stop even having a lot of sinful thoughts. He can take away temptation so you're not even tempted towards evil. And when he comes back, you will be completely removed from temptation. There will be no more evil desire at all. And that's what we're looking forward to, church. So anywho... The day of the Lord is coming as judgment because there are some who have not received that. There are some who are so identified with their sin because that is every single part of their life and they will be destroyed in the day of the Lord. And so verse 11 gives us this warning. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? You see, when you take the picture of fire, when you see the symbolism of that, and you realize that a lot of things in our lives are going to melt away. And the only things that are going to remain are the eternal things. Okay, I I know it's a bit of bold imagery, but just follow me on this, if you will. So I can tell you all the time that I spent on basketball, however fun that might have been, is just going to sort of melt away in eternity. That stuff's not going to matter. All this time I spend on my house, as much as I might love working on my house and making it look nice, in eternity, that's not going to matter. Only the eternal things are actually going to last forever. So your soul is eternal. So what he's saying is, since this is going to be the case, what manner of life should you live? What should you actually focus on? That's the message here. Yeah, you, some of those things need to be done. Trust me, you need to mow your grass. Otherwise, it'll get overgrown, and I mean, it's, it's not a good thing when your grass gets too long. You need to take care of earthly things, but understand that those things aren't going to last forever, so make sure there's a higher priority than that, and that priority is your soul, living in righteousness and holiness. That has to be our biggest goal, is to grow in relationship with God and with Jesus, and to watch what that does to our character. Because believe it or not, growing in righteousness and holiness will actually help you become disciplined about taking care of your lawn, about taking care of your house, about taking care of your kids and your spouse. It's amazing because godliness has value in all things. But let's continue. Verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. So he says what we are waiting for, he's reminding them as he is about to pass on, this is what you are looking forward to. This is what you are looking for. Okay? Most of the things in the Bible are things that have already taken place. So Peter wanted to make sure to remind them of what was still to come. There is, whether it's a series of events or a combination of events, there are a couple of things that we are looking forward to, church. We are looking forward to the day of Christ where he comes back to save us and the day of the Lord where he comes back to judge the earth. Whether you want to call those one combined event or multiple events, I I won't argue with you there because, as I mentioned before, weathermen, they they study the weather very hard. They work hard at their jobs, but they are not good at predicting the future a week away. You know, the Bible experts at the time didn't recognize Jesus. The Pharisees didn't really recognize him, but they had spent plenty of time in the Word trying to make those predictions of what would happen. So, so I won't, like I said, I won't try to argue with you about exactly which thing's going to happen first, and then. but I can tell you what we are looking for. We are looking for the Lord to come back to save us, and we are looking for him to come back and judge the earth. So he says, but according... To his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So here's the thing. Right now, we're, Christians are just, we're in a weird place. We are, we are called pilgrims because we are in a place that is not really our home. You know, we live in this old world still, but we're a new creation. There's going to come a day... When Jesus Christ returns, that we will live on a new earth, which righteousness will dwell. In that, you know, the, think of the best times you've had with the church. The best times you've had in, you know, God's presence, so to speak. And understand that that will be the norm in the new heavens and the earth. That will be the norm in the new creation. There will be no more obstacles of sin. There will be no more obstacles of sinful government. There will be no more obstacles of famine or plague or death or sickness, anything like that. But we will truly live in a righteous and good and holy earth. 
That is our destination, church. And I cannot stress enough to you how important it is to remember that. So when you are going through difficulty, you can look forward and say, man, I can't wait for that day. Man, I can't wait to be with Jesus. Man, I can't wait. You know, when you go to, the Bible says that the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. So one of the, one of the most sobering days for you is when you go to a funeral. When you go, you see a loved one pass on, and that's tough. It's challenging. But if you have this mind in you, then you can say, man, I look forward to seeing him again. Man, yeah, I'm sad to see him gone. I'm sad that I don't get to see him anymore, but there's going to come a day where I will be with them forever and ever without sickness, without death, without aging. You long for that day. The things of this world start to seem less important the more you start to think about that day. That's what I'm saying, church. We still have hobbies on this earth, and that's good and well, but the more you get your mind wrapped around eternity, the less the earthly things matter, and that's a good thing for you. Let's continue. He says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Okay, since this is what we're waiting for, we are waiting for this world where righteousness dwells. He says, be diligent. What does diligent mean? That means this takes discipline. This takes hard work at times. We are not saved by our works. We are saved by grace alone. But that does not mean that we are simply lazy in the faith. We still have to be diligent and be disciplined with our walk with the Lord. How easy is it? How easy is it to skip reading the Bible for a few days? Man, it's easy. You, you know, you, other things will always come up and they will always be more convenient to you than opening up the word. Opening the word of God, however enjoyable it might be, is never convenient. There's always something more convenient. But this is good for your soul. And so Peter says, be diligent that we might be found without spot or blemish. That when we go to heaven, so to speak, or when we go to this new earth, that we'll be ready to live in it. That it won't be such a, you know, difference from the way we live our lives now that we're just in complete culture shock more than we already will be. I mean, it's impossible to compare the imperfect to the perfect, but that we might know, that we might understand, that we might be ready to go and be there, that we might be ready to operate in a righteous world, that we can get rid of our bitterness. Because, you know, I know this is out there, you know, I know this happens, that we can assume the worst in other people at times, and there's going to be absolutely no need for that in the new earth. There is going to be no worst in other people. Everyone else is going to be perfectly righteous. We've got to get our minds set. We've got to get you know, ready for this to happen. And we, it requires diligence to get there. Okay, That we might be found without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. So he says count the patience as salvation. Salvation, all right? Guys, God's patience and judgment is salvation for us, but not just for us, but for all those who we can reach. However much time we have left on this earth, the most important thing we can be doing with that time is spreading the gospel so that others can go to be with the Lord too. That's the most important thing we can do. So count his patience as salvation. The longer... I've been following the Lord, the more I've longed to leave the world and go to be with him. There are times, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but there are times when I get really down in my soul. And there are times that I get down that it's, you know, that it's over silly things. But there are times that you just look at the world and you see how sad many things have become. And it just gives you a deep sorrow. And the world will tell you, you know, oh, you shouldn't be sad at all. Things are great. You should be happy all the time. But but sorrow can be healthy to the soul at times. Sorrow can be good for you because sorrow, when I see the world around me, just makes me long to go to be with Jesus. That changes my mind and puts my perspective on him. Okay, but so Paul mentioned this and so Paul's mentioned here, says Paul mentioned, I would rather go to be with him, but it is better for you that I am here. So there are times, church, that I would rather go to be with Jesus. You know, I would rather the work, the toil, the striving, the difficulty be over. But it says, it is better that I am here with you, ministering to you guys. It is better that you are here ministering to others. And ministering does not always mean preaching out loud. It often means serving. It often means being there for people. But that is why God has left us here. 
Okay, that is why we have time left on this earth. Those who have passed on to be with him, hey, it was better to them to go and be in his presence at that point. You know, life gets really painful at a certain age, so I hear. And it can get worse. Your health can get worse and worse. But thanks be to God, when you go to be with him, there is no more pain. So there's a time where it's more important for you to be here on this earth and working. And there's a time where it's more beneficial and more important for you to go and be with him. And that's beautiful. That's great. But he also mentions, and this, this kind of starts to get funny. Uh, but he mentions that Paul has also wrote to us about this stuff according to the wisdom given him. Verse 16, this is one of the funniest verses in all of the passage. Uh, he says, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. A couple very important things in here. First of all, Peter was reading Paul's writings, and Peter was a guy who walked with Jesus on a daily basis, and he said, yeah, some of the things in here are tough to understand. And I say a big amen to that. Sometimes Paul's writings are really tough to understand, amen? Yeah, the word of God can be challenging at times, and I love that Peter wrote this here because it acknowledges that it's challenging, so it makes me not, not feel like such a dummy when I struggle with it at times. You know, it's meant to be challenging because it's trying to communicate something eternal and perfect and holy to creatures who, by our own nature, when we were born, were not good and righteous and holy. We were sinful, okay? So it's tough to understand, but then also something else he mentions, he says that the ignorant and unstable twist these words to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Two important things about that. Number one, Peter is saying, hey, the words of Paul are scripture. You know, these were written as letters that were distributed to the churches, so it's hard to know sometimes, hey, did they know that what they were writing was going to end up being a Bible? Did they know that? Peter was already acknowledging that what Paul had written down was scripture but also that the ignorant and unstable would twist those words. Sometimes the false teachers will quote parts of the Bible, but what you'll find is they will take it out of context. This is why, church, this is why I endeavor to go chapter to chapter, line by line, verse by verse, because it's really easy to pull one verse out and read it just by itself and then make it say anything you want it to say. You know, Philippians 4.13 is a popular one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many athletes put that one, you know, on, on their shoes, on their jersey? You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, does that apply to athletics? It could, but that's not what Paul was talking about. That's out of context. He says, hey, I've been through famine. I've been through danger. I've had a lot. I've had very little. And through all of that, I've learned that whatever comes my way, basically, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Another one is, you know, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans for a good hope and a bright future, something along those lines. Man, it's really easy to take that out and say, hey, God wants to prosper me. Well, is that true? Well, are you obeying God? You know, the unbeliever, the disobedient, the ungodly, if they said that, oh, God, you want to prosper me. Well, prospering for you is going to mean repentance. Okay? It's easy for people to take and twist scripture to what they want it to mean rather than reading it and trying to understand what it actually means. And so Peter makes sure to warn even about that. So verse 17, he says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. You know, when I was in high school... There was a girl, she didn't claim to be a Christian, but, you know, she was trying to talk about the Bible, and she said, you know, the Bible says eat, drink, and be merry. Well, you know, I was just reading that passage recently in Scripture, and it certainly does. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is writing about that, but what he's saying is, basically, the life is so vain that without God, there is no more than eat, drink, and be merry. But because there is a God and there is an eternity, there's more to life than that. So, how would I know that she was saying this is in the Bible? Well, it was in the Bible, but how are you going to know what's true and what's false? You got to read it for yourself. Just as I mentioned before. So he says, don't, so take care that you are not carried away 
by the era of lawless people, lose your own stability. There is great stability in the word of God. As I mentioned, when I first got saved, I was hanging out with all sorts of people who called themselves Christians, but the live, their lives didn't reflect that. But the only way I could see that was by reading the Bible, and over the course of time, the areas that they were disagreeing with the Bible became more and more clear. So we have to grow, as this next verse, this last verse says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And so what, yes, amen. So what this passage is saying here, Peter is trying to Focus our minds in here. The Bible is 66 books. There is a ton to learn in this, but there is a simple message throughout, and Peter is trying to summarize that message. You know, he started the book with a very similar phrase. In chapter 1 of 2 Peter, he said in verse 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And at the very end, he once again says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is a simple theme that Peter wants us to make sure that we have in mind. Your job while you are here on this earth as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are waiting for the Lord to return, you are growing in knowledge and grace in him, and you are trying to spread that grace and knowledge to others. That is the simplicity of the Christian life. It can be very difficult to do in given situations, but what you are actually trying to do is very simple. Christianity is hard, but it's not complicated. It's really simple. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, waiting for his return, and counting the time of waiting as salvation. That is what you were here to do, church, and that is what I wanted to remind you of while we are out of our normal routine, because guys... You know as well as I do, church can become about so many various things that are less important than this. They can become about so many other things, things that need to be done, but the primary purpose of why we are here is simple. We are all here to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to develop that fellowship with each other, to, as we wait for his coming, and while we wait, to Preach that salvation to everyone that we can. That is what we're here for, and that is what we will continue to do, church. There will be obstacles that will come against that, but we need to just be reminded every now and again, this is what we are here for. So if you'll take out, if you'll take out your communion supplies here, I remind you once more, there's a reason we do this on a weekly basis, because that message is summed up in what you're going to do. We have to remember what it took to save us and what the message of the cross is. The message of the cross is that his body was broken so that yours does not have to be. His blood was spilled so that your sin might be forgiven. Just as in the Passover, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So please take of the bread and drink of the juice. And let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, as I mentioned so often, renew our minds. That is, set our focus on you. Away from all the other things that want our attention. Lord, you know that those things need to be done. But as you've said in your word, if we will seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, all these things will be added to us. Help us to put you front and center in our focus, front and center in our focus, that we might have the perspective, that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of you, that everything else will be taken care of, but, but that we will truly give our time to you. Help us not lose that, O oh God, as we move back towards a sense of normalcy. Let us not move back towards complacency. Oh God, but let us move forward in this grace. Let us continue to grow because that which is growing and being renewed cannot help but to bear more and more fruit, but that which becomes complacent withers away. Dear God, let us not wither away, but let us continue to strongly move forward in your grace because it's only by your grace that we can do anything. Please, Lord, continue to transform us and glorify your name. Lord, show us your presence in our midst. 
I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. As you're about to leave, a reminder, next Sunday we will be back here one last time. If the weather permits and you want to bring lawn chairs or something like that, please keep your six feet of distance, but you're welcome to do that. Don't take this time. So understand, I'm excited to get back in the building. If you can't tell up here, I'm about as sweaty as I can get. But don't, don't, uh... Don't think that there's not something extra special about this time. There's something special about getting out of your normal routine because it gets your attention, which that's the purpose. That's the point of all of this for us, to get our attention and to focus us in. Focus us in. So please have a great holiday weekend. God bless you guys, and we'll see you back next week.